again my fellow freedom builders. Today we're going to talk about a topic that really interests a lot of people. We're going to talk about passive income. What is it? What kind of passive income streams are there? And is it actually real? Does it exist? And is it desirable? That's also a point I'll touch on, on today. First of all, the word or the term passive income kind of indicates that I get some money and I get it without doing anything. That is not really true, at least in most cases. Of course, there is the possibility of you putting a million dollars or $10 million into some sort of market ETF or mutual fund that gives you money every month or every quarter, every year, and you don't have to do anything. But besides that, many of the income streams, at least many of my income streams that I'm going to tell you about in the next video, they demand some sort of work from me and today I'm going to show you what I call the five factors of passive income. There are five things that I consider when I look down over my income streams and I'm going to show you that in, in the next video as, as I mentioned. I'm going to make a list of these but first of all I'll describe to you what how I evaluate my different income streams because there are these five factors that are very important because it is not just passive income or active income, so that you have to work for your income or you don't have to work for your income. There are a lot of grey zones that I'll describe for you today. And let me give you some examples from what some of my income streams where I can show you what I mean. First of all, the first factor is the number of hours. What is the number of hours that I need to work on a on a monthly basis, a weekly basis, a yearly basis to maintain this sort of income. And as I said, if I put all my money in some sort of market ETF, it doesn't really take any of my work. Maybe once per year I can just open my account and see, oh well, it has gone up 10% or down 5% or whatever. But in my normal income streams, I have several of them that actually takes some hours per, per week or per day or per month to maintain. Let's say, for instance, I have my income stream, that is my subscription area. Uh, in Denmark, in, in Danish, I have a subscription area for investors where I talk about the different um, good investment options that are in, uh, in Denmark, on, in Sweden and in Norway. And I comment on Trump's tweets and Brexit, uh, all that kind of stuff. But it actually takes quite a lot of hours. It might take 10 or 15 hours per week for me. I love this work, but you wouldn't call it completely passive income. On the other hand, for instance, I had written three books when I had my consultant company. And um, these three books today, the first of them, of them I wrote something like 15 years ago, I think. And all, of, all three of them are still, uh, are still selling. So every week or every month I get some orders in. And the number of hours it takes me to maintain this business is just let's say 15 minutes per month just packing some books and sending them off and, and writing an invoice that's it so these two if you were to evaluate these two income streams the the books and the subscription area well on a passive income scale the books would actually be the best because they are a lot less demanding but there are of course other uh, factors and number two is, is very much, it's kind of the same as the first, I'm still selling. So every week or every month I get some orders in and the number of hours it takes me to maintain this business is just, let's say, 15 minutes per month. Just packing some books and sending them off and, and writing an invoice. That's it. So these two, if you were to evaluate these two income streams, the, the books, and the subscription area, well, on a passive income scale, the books would actually be the best because they are a lot less demanding. But there are, of course, other uh, factors. And number two is, is very much, it's kind of the same as the first. The first was the number of hours, but the second is how time sensitive is this work? Because let's say I just have a normal job from nine to five. That's quite sensitive. 
uh, as to when you should meet uh, uh, meet in, when you should clock in uh, in the morning. So if it is a nine to five, you are expected to be there at nine o'clock and you can go home at five, maybe with some slight differences. I know there are more flexible uh, job types, but let's just say this is a standard nine to five, then it is extremely time, se time sensitive. If you like to work in the middle of the night, you cannot just say to your, to your boss, well, I'm not coming in today, but I will do the work in the middle of the night because maybe that's not possible in this line of work. So a normal job is very time sensitive. What about my subscription area? Well, unless it is something about the Brexit vote or a specific Trump tweet or some financial news, I can do it whenever I want. And I love to work pretty much in the middle of the night when the kids are asleep. So a lot of my work is done somewhere between eight o'clock in the evening and two o'clock uh, at night. So it is not time sensitive at all. And that's a big factor for me that I really love about it. What about the books if we compare it to, uh, to them? Well, these books, it's not time sensitive either because I can send them whenever I want. So they are kind of equal there. All right, then there is a very important factor to me and that is factor three. That is scalability. Is it possible to scale this income up without doing a lot of extra work? Let's say for instance, when I had my consultant company and it was given quite a good pay, but I had to be present. It was time sensitive. It took quite a lot of hours. There was a good pay, but it was not really possible to scale up. If I were making $10,000 one month, if I were to make 20,000 the next month, I would have to work twice as much. And that was not possible with, with my kids that were small and, and I have a, a wife and some hobbies and some sports. And so it was not possible. There was a, a, a finite limit as to how much I could make with the, with the amount of hours I had uh, available. My subscription area, if you take that one, well, right now we are around, what, 200 members or something like that. If that were to grow to 2000 members, I wouldn't have to work 10 times as much. I might have to work a bit more uh, answering some questions on, on the, on the uh, Facebook group and so on. But if that was too wild, I could hire someone to do it if I had 2000 members. So that is scalability. The, the amount I, I earn at 200 members and the amount I earn at 2000 members are almost 10 times as much with some uh, slight differences but because of extra costs. But the time I have to spend is definitely not 10, 10 times as much. So that's one thing I truly love about this subscription business I have. What about the books that are almost completely passive? I've spent maybe 15 minutes per, per month, as I said and it is uh, not time sensitive, but it's a scalable. Not really, because I'm not in that kind of business anymore. Uh, I, I sold my consultant business uh, some years ago, and today I don't really have the network and, and, the, and the channels to sell these books. So of course, if I spend a lot of money on advertising, I might be able to sell some more books, but it is not real. It would take a lot of work for me to kickstart that entire uh, niche of, of income again. So right now it is actually not really scalable. I would have to put an insane amount of money in, in 10 xing uh, the amount of books I sell. I might be able to do it, but it would take a lot of work and a lot of money. So that one is not really scalable. The same as if you have a normal job, just nine to five, is that scalable? No, not really. Because if you want to make 25% more, you might have to stay 25% longer at the job or take some extra shifts uh, at holidays or weekends or nights or whatever. So it might be possible, but it's not very scalable. So scalability is a very important factor here. The last two factors are about risk. The first risk I'm considering when I'm looking at my income streams is what, what is the risk that this income stream will fade away and disappear? If we take the subscription area and the books, well, the subscription area, as long as I keep commenting and, and people are telling their friends and their families that you should subscribe to this, uh, to this channel, well, then that is not disappearing. 
Of course, if I got ill, it would probably uh, fade away. But as long as I am uh, healthy and I keep working with it, it's not going anywhere. What about the books? Well, it is a lot of, of years since I, since I wrote them. And I can see already that they're not selling as well as they did two or three or five years ago because new books are coming, more updated books with some uh, famous, well-known celebrity authors that is way better at selling their books than I am. So that is fading away. So the risk of, of disappearing, that the income stream is disappearing, is actually quite large with the books. I suspect that in two or three years, I'll not be making any more money on that uh, income stream. That would be that would surprise me if that uh, kept going for much longer. The subscription area, well, that one is just growing and growing. And I'm thinking of uh, hiring some student help in and so on, so that I can actually be a bit more free. So it's getting less and less time sensitive because other people uh, do the work. All right, so that was one of the risk factors. That was the risk of the income stream disappearing. Then there is another risk factor, and that is the fifth factor that I'm considering. And that is, what is the risk that I lose the money that I have invested in this some sort of venture or income stream? Well, if we look at our, my subscription area, uh, I have put quite a lot of money into that, but I have made that back already so there's not much risk involved there. Of course, if I closed it all down, I would be losing my, my investor capital, that's for sure. But I have made it all back and, and there's no way that I'm closing my, my subscription area. So, well, there's not much risk there. What about the books? That took a lot of time to write and to edit and so on. And of course, I had to, to, to buy a, a stock of books that I could sell from. But, well, there's not much, much risk involved in that either. But let's take a look at one of my other uh, actually quite good income streams. And that is money that I have invested in some currency algorithms. One of my uh, friends here from Denmark, he has been developing these uh, algorithms for 10 or 15 years. And he's very good at it. And uh, I put some money into that. Not huge sums, but uh, some money. And um, I'll show you later in a video how much money I have allocated to stocks and algorithms and all of that stuff. So it's, it's not a secret, but let's just keep this claim to the five factors. The money that I put into these algorithms is not time sensitive because the algorithms is doing all the work and I'm not spending many hours because, well, I don't have to. It is a computer trading for me. Um, scalability, well, I can put all that money into it that I want and um, the algos are not going anywhere, so there's no risk of it fading away. But there, there is a risk of me losing my money. Because as I'm going to make more videos about, because risk is one of my main issues I'm talking a lot about, uh, that if you get an overnormal uh, performance on your money, if you are making 5% per month, where others are making a quarter of a percent per year, then you're taking on more risk. And I can definitely see that the currency account is quite volatile. So there is quite a lot of risk involved in me losing my money. Well, not all of them actually, because there are different stop loss uh, features in place here, but at least a lot of them. And I do risk that if I need the money all of a sudden for something else, a new car or something for my kids, if I wanted to take out the money from the currency, I might risk that that was at the exact point where my, where my funding were down 30 or 40 percent or something like that. So that is the fifth risk. That is the money I put into, the, in, into this income stream. Is there any risk that I lose that? It could also be, I'm looking at other uh, investment uh, vehicles, it could be solar cells or windmills, or it could be, well, I'm gonna make a lot of videos about these alternative uh, investment vehicles, but it could be something else where you can say, well, that is state guaranteed, a government guaranteed, uh, so it, it might not give as, lot, as, uh, as, as much performance as my currency algorithms, but there's absolutely no risk involved because there are a lot of guarantees in place. So just to sum up, I have these 
five factors that I'm looking at. That is, how much time do I have to spend to maintain this income stream? Number two, have time, how time sensitive is it? Can I work whenever I want uh, or do I have to work in, in certain time slots? Um, and I'm, I'm not a fan of that. I want the free schedule. I want to work whenever I want to. Number three was scalability. Can I 10x or 100x this income stream without having to work 10 times or 100 times as much? And then there were the last two, the, the two risk factors. Is there a risk that this way of making money will disappear? And is there a risk that I lose the money I have invested into this income stream? All right, I hope that makes sense. In my next video, I will list all of the different income streams I have. I'll uh, tell you approximately how much I make per, per month. And in the future, I will around once per month, I will make a new video so, you, you, so that you can follow the progress I'm making, hopefully not too many setbacks, where you can look at my salary factor and my freedom factor that I talked about in, in an earlier video. So I'll make that list for you, but I am evaluating all income streams on these five factors. And I urge you to do the same because that can, when we look at our uh, list of income streams, um, we can evaluate if we should put more effort into growing one of the income streams and less into growing another. Let's say, for instance, that I have my subscription area and it is taking, let's say, 100 hours per month and it's making some money and it is not as time sensitive uh, as, uh, as it could be. But let's say that I get a completely new income stream that is making almost the same amount of money but with two hours of work per month and still not time sensitive, well, when I have to prioritize my daily hours of work, I would put more work into this if it is the same scalability because it is an income stream that fits me better. I'm going to show you a lot of examples of this, but this is just the, the core principles. This is the frame that I work within. I hope it makes sense to you. Otherwise, please comment in the comment section below with questions and so on. And also, as I said earlier, please remember to subscribe down there and also like the video if you like it, of course, because that tells YouTube that this sort of stuff is important and that will pop up uh, with you in your YouTube uh, interface when I put up a new video. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for your time. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.